Welcome to the Own It Powercast, the place to be when you get serious about making big changes and accelerating growth in your life and in your relationships. Finally create the life you've always wanted, living life on your own terms. Learn how to take your fear and turn it into powerful choices that will create sustained change. Now your host, Mary Baker. Hey everyone, welcome back to Own It Powercast a place where you can come to get what you need to move yourself forward. As you know, my name is Mary Baker, and I'm here to give you the education, the tools, and the motivation to identify exactly what's in your way today, and the best part, what you can do about it. Because remember, empowerment comes from doing. By truly identifying what's really going on, what's really causing the issues, and all the positive changes you need to make to increase your self-confidence and have healthier relationships and take charge of your life. Okay, so all month we've been talking about healthy boundaries and we're going to continue talking about them for another month as well because as I've been sharing with you, I think it's a huge paradigm and one that deserves enough attention and detail. So today I want to talk about the necessary grief work we need to do if we're going to be able to set healthy boundaries that we really mean and that we can actually follow through on and maintain, not just throwing ultimatums down when we're upset and angry. If you haven't already, it might be helpful to go back and listen to the previous episode, episode 12, where we talked about detachment and choosing. And then come back here and join us because that way it'll make more sense to you. So before we dive in, I want to just give a big shout out to those of you who are crushing it doing this work. I just think that's so fabulous. Know that the work that you're doing just by listening to this stuff is helping you change. Where your attention goes, energy flows, remember? So just by focusing on this, your brain is going to help you point out situations in your life where you may need to set some boundaries and take some action It may explain why you've been feeling what you've been feeling. But I'm just so proud of those of you who have shared with me your commitment to the work, your commitment to yourself, and how you're even starting to see some of the benefits. Okay, so let's get into the fabulous topic of grief work, right? I know it's not glamorous, but it's necessary. Why it's necessary for us to do the grief work after we detach and let go in love, like we talked about last time. Because this concept is mostly talked about in addiction circles, right? Because the person has a loved one who is just a mess, they're addicted, they're acting out. And so that's where we usually hear these terms. But I think letting go can be hard in many types of relationship dynamics without addictions going on. Whenever there is one person who is not doing right and another there willing to rescue and parent them, the enmeshment happens. So when you think about after you detach and say, okay, I can't change them, I need to let go, then the next focus is what do I need to lose or let go of? in terms of the dream, you know, the ideal, what I thought was really going to be, was going to happen, was going to happen for me, for them, for us, for the whole family. That's a big deal. The higher the stakes, the longer we hold on, I think, and the harder it is to detach and let go, because then you're asking yourself to let go of all of it, of all that wonderful stuff. That's difficult. That's hard. You're going to have to be the bad guy. I mean, the whole conundrum is, They're not seeing what they're doing or not doing. They're not ready to change. They don't get it because if they got it, we wouldn't be having this conversation, would we? We wouldn't need to. So know going in that you're going to probably be hated. You might be resented. They may not speak to you. They may have a tantrum, melt down, rage at you, tell other people how awful and uncaring and selfish you are, on and on and on. I think it's really helpful to prepare for this going in, like even before you set that limit. When I sit with clients, I'm like, okay, let's do a tactical plan here because you can't go in and not realize this is going to be awful. Because if you do, you're going to cave. 
you'll recant, you'll go back, you'll say it's okay, we'll try again, you'll, you'll do this one more time and one more time and one more time, unless you are absolutely prepared for all different types of scenarios and that it's not going to be easy. The parents out there, you know what I'm talking about when you have a little one who doesn't want to listen, doesn't want to eat their dinner, doesn't want to stop playing and get in the bathtub, doesn't want to go to bed, doesn't want to do their homework. You know what that's like. The hard part is maintaining the boundary, not setting it. Setting it's almost the easier part. We think it's the scary part, but it's not. Maintaining it and not being worn down is the hardest part in the world. And, and we'll talk about that in a future episode about maintaining boundaries in a healthy way. But I also think a big part of being able to maintain those boundaries is doing the grief work. And sometimes we have to do this preemptively, like I was mentioning a moment ago. You know, do it now. Let yourself hurt now. That way, you're not in so much fear when you throw down that boundary. You're going to have to walk through a lot of feelings here. And we're going to talk about some of this today. So many of you are familiar with Kubler-Ross's Stages of Grief. If not, I encourage you to go look that up and you'll get a, probably a much better explanation than I'm giving here. I'm just focusing on other aspects of these stages as we go through in terms of letting go. If you need to pause and, and go do some reading about that and understanding, totally fine. So the first stage in the stages of grief, they spell out DABDA, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, is denial. Denial stands for don't even know I am lying. And we can be here for a long time. Some people never leave this phase. Because you're super focused on them. You're super focused on the person, the situation, the circumstances that you can't seem to get to change no matter what you do. You're often thinking that awful loop in your head. Why can't they just fill in the blank? I think here is where we can often contort ourselves instead of asking them to change. This is a big one. This is something I run into all the time for people because it can be so subtle and gradual. You know, you just stop asking for what you need over time because it was an argument. They give you the vibe that they're not interested in doing something different. You can't, quote unquote, trust them to take the trash out, to pay their bills on time, to support you, to partner with you, to be responsible. There is an initiative there. So rather than standing in the middle of the kitchen with your arms crossed and say, eh, eh, this ain't happening no more, you will quietly, quietly go about contorting yourself. You'll rescue You'll make sure the bills are paid. You'll make sure there's food in the fridge. You'll make sure someone's talking about our marriage because that's less scarier in the moment than you facing the reality like, oh my God, what am I dealing with here? Remember that parallel process, what I wish they would do, I need to do. And so when you're so caught up in that swirl of rescuing and compensating and all this stuff under the guise of, I, I love them, I care about them, they're too stressed out to do it, all that stuff you tell yourself, that you don't see it. Keep yourself in denial. This is not to beat yourself up if, you're, if you find that you're doing that. Lots of compassion. There are reasons why we stay in denial. But now that you've detached, you can't do that anymore. Now that you come out of denial, you start getting really pissed and frustrated because you have to bring it back to you now. Yep, you're upset with them, but you're probably also pretty pissed with yourself for getting into this mess in the first place of not doing something about it earlier in the game. I hear that all the time. Because you know deep down, if they don't change, you would be faced with some possibly awful decisions like we talked about in the last episode. A lot of times this can throw us back into anger or is it really fear? I don't know. Or is it both? So anger is when you realize, uh-oh, I can't control the outcomes anymore. It's when you start feeling so burnt out and exhausted. It's when maybe your body catches up with you and you have illness or you start having other physical limitations. 
reality maybe is just showing itself a lot more to you now. Maybe you just can't deny it anymore. You can't rationalize it away. You can't pretend it's something else going on. Maybe something awful had to happen. Maybe all the things you've tried aren't working anyway because they never do. This is all about control, right? That's what we're talking about. And control is all about fear. It's all about using maneuvers such as fixing them, rescuing them, and enmeshing with them for fear of being separate, fear of trusting things to work out on their own because maybe they haven't worked out on their own in the past for you. Maybe you trusted other people when you were very vulnerable, probably when you were growing up, and they dropped the ball. They let you down. They blew it. Fear of being real and honest in the relationship. The big one, fear of conflict, fear of someone's anger, fear of someone hating you, fear of not knowing what to do when conflict happens, fear of bursting that bubble of denial around what the real truth is here. I think we slide in and out of denial sometimes until we're ready. Fear because letting go feels like loosening your finger grip on the edge of that rock cliff because you know you're going to fall a hell of a long way and you wonder, will you even make it through the fall? So this means you have to have lots of compassion for yourself. This is not easy at all. I think a big help in that is, again, looking at the context of how you got here. If you've been listening to me, you know I'm all about context. I don't do vacuums. Look at what you drew to you in your life. Look at why there was a lack of boundaries when this relationship even started. Maybe you allowed yourself to be manipulated Maybe you ignore the red flags. It's your child, and what parent ever wants to have to deal with this, right? Your family of origin was the earliest setup of all. Like I've talked about before on these episodes, if that was unhealthy, you didn't get to see the signs as quickly as someone else would. They were normalized for you. And you drew like to you, like those folks you grew up with. Because this is where all your control issues started. If a child grew up with awful templates of conflict from their parents losing their shit or even just verbal abuse, shaming, manipulation, well, forget then learning how to have the courage to set limits with someone. Because if the only template you have is it's awful, people leave, people beat each other up, people scream and yell, they throw stuff, they break things, they threaten Who would want to not avoid that? Or maybe you grew up with very passive parents who didn't set any boundaries at all. And you learned that it was unkind and mean and selfish to say no to someone. If a child grows up in a home where big things happened that they could not control, they also figured somehow they would do things to control things. Like maybe if I'm the good compliant child, mom and dad will be happy. Maybe dad won't drink. Maybe I'll make up for my brothers acting out. Maybe I'll stabilize my family. I'll make everything okay. I'll caretake a sibling or a parent. I'll rescue them. I'll cook dinner. I'll take care of my little brother. I'll make it okay. Instead of detaching and saying, whoa, this is not okay and not my job. Because never being taught that setting boundaries, letting go and grieving is the only way to go and the healthy way if you were never being shown that, hey, you deserve healthy in your life, you deserve to be treated well, you deserve to have a partner or a best friend that's a grown up. And you're not a bad mom for setting a firm limit with your out of control hurting teenager, and so on, and so on, and so on. All this stuff had to be normalized for you. Healthy need to be pointed out, and so did unhealthy. And why healthy is healthy and unhealthy is unhealthy? Like, what are the ramifications? So here's where you start getting angry in your relationship. You got your head out of some orifice and you begin to get really pissed. Yep, sometimes really, really pissed because you realize, whoa, this is not okay. Like I've talked before about when I work with clients and they're in a really bad situation, they're not ready to leave and they're making all kinds of excuses for it. Pushing them is not ever the answer. But if we sit and we talk about contrast and they start experiencing contrast, like other people treat them nicely, but maybe their spouse doesn't kind of thing. 
they start seeing the difference. So you're angry and you probably find yourself bitching and moaning a lot about what's going on. You hear yourself saying in so many ways, I can't believe they. Because you're realizing the truth, right? You're looking at what's at stake here. You're hitting the big wall of reality and terror is setting in for real. Because it can be pretty awful and hard to accept. It's fear slash anger slash denial back to fear, back to anger, back to denial when you can't handle it. Because anger is the protector. Now, I want to mention the concept of protracted grief here. This is not where we want to stay. I think all of us have come across a person over the years who was stuck in anger. They're just angry. And they're always focused on everything that's wrong outside of them. Because it's safer to do that. As opposed to getting into the deeper vulnerable feelings of, I'm hurt and I'm sad and I'm scared. So... The next stage is bargaining. So as you work through this part, you'll find yourself doing the what ifs and the if onlys, and you'll run back through scenarios and focus on if they had only done this or not done that, if I had done this and not done that, and you're trying to like metabolize reality that you can't change. So in a sense, we're trying to rewrite it. We're trying to make it unhappen by going back in time and saying, if only I'd done this. It's a necessary part of grieving. It's a natural thing. Everyone has to do it. We don't want to stay here, but we walk through it. One of the things to think about as you're saying to yourself, if only I had done this and they hadn't done that, we have to remember that even if we had, something different might have happened. Even if they had done something different, it doesn't mean that we control all the variables. We think we can but we really can't. And that helps us let go a little bit more. Yes, part of this is the learning, the kick in the pants, like, damn it, I wish I had done that. And some of that is necessary because there are gentle lessons that we need to learn. But also some of it is just not true. Or we don't know if absolutely, if you had taken the car keys that night, something else could have happened just as bad. So we need to remember that. So oftentimes you'll find yourself vacillating between anger and bargaining and back to anger then into bargaining for a couple days or a week and back to anger. Sometimes you'll cycle in and out between both of them all day long and it's okay. You'll do what you need to do. These stages aren't necessarily linear. I just think it's helpful to realize, okay, what's going on with me? Oh, okay. I know I'm angry. I'm hurting grief, anger, or I'm bargaining again. What am I doing? What's going on here? So that you can have some understanding and compassion for yourself and you'll be less likely to act out with more self-awareness. So the next stage is depression. Here's where you let go and you're just sad. Maybe depressed some days. You find you're not fighting or you're not fighting for it or you're not fighting it or them anymore. You're not fighting yourself, are you? This is where resignation sets in. But this is where the magic is. That's because trying to get someone to change, you had to immerse yourself in them and lose yourself bit by bit, little by little, subtly over time. You heard me say it. If you do nothing else in your personal growth, learn how to grieve, to surrender, to be sad. It brings you to your vulnerability, which can be terrifying, as we've been talking about. It cleanses you. You work through grief work on a gut level, not in your head. You're dealing with the real truth. It's hard to be controlling and surrender to what is at the same time, but it's not crazy for you to kind of roller coaster in and out of, okay, this is awful, I'm sad, to then grasping onto hope at another day. So maybe if, going all the way back to bargaining, right? So again, these are not linear, discrete phases that kind of morph into one another. Whatever is left to be worked through, we'll go back. We'll go back to bargaining if we need to, for as long as we need to. 
There's a quote that my old mentor used to use, and he would say, you can't heal what isn't real. And it isn't real until you feel it. You got to let yourself feel these feelings. You can't do this work in your left brain. It's not possible. So there are some things that you're going to need for this part of the journey. And these aren't even all of them, but I think these are some big ones. The number one thing you're going to need is support, healthy support. I think it's really difficult to walk through this part alone. So please turn to at least one or two people who are safe, who can hold on to you as you walk through this because they get it. Because depending on the stakes involved, these could be some huge losses for you that you're preparing yourself for. This is no joke. It could be a loss of a marriage, a loss of a relationship, leaving work that you love because the workplace is so toxic, leaving a best friend, and a big one, letting go of your family of origin. That's often the hardest. I think it's biologically built in not to let go, and it's extremely difficult for people. When I work with relationships, um... And one partner just refuses to look at their completely toxic family. And we're looking at him like he's crazy. It's so difficult because to open that can of worms is a big deal. Because it's not just letting go of your family. It's your belongingness need. It's your identity, your whole history. Everything comes into question. And it just feels inherently wrong to have to do that. So... Those are some big ones. So find a safe place or two to belong as you let go of an unhealthy person or a group of people or a situation because no one lets go without something at least good enough to hold on to while you're letting go. Let me repeat that. No one lets go of something, I don't care how awful it is, until they have something to replace it with. In other words, it needs to meet similar needs. So if I'm going to let go of my family of origin, my marriage or my relationship better be healthy enough right now so I can hold on to that. Our Facebook group is a great place if you want to join in there because we'll support you there for sure. Finding a counselor, finding a 12-step group or other support group. I think we need more than one person. It's funny because that's why you often see someone step out of a relationship before they end it because they don't feel strong enough. So it's psychological, but they're like, okay, well, at least I have this person, my affair partner. They love me. They listen to me. They talk to me. They care about me. I feel connected to them. The other thing I would encourage is lots of patience. This is a process. And if you try to start controlling it too, you're back to square one. Remember, you're either controlling the crap out of outcomes, even if only in your head, or you're surrendering to the grief process and you're not in charge anymore. Maybe it's taken too damn long. Let yourself get angry and grieve that you even have to grieve. Grieve all the subtle layers. It's okay. It's important. It's real. I don't think it's genuine to not be pissed that you even have to grieve, that you even have to do this. Again, we're just kicking and screaming to acceptance around reality. That's all that's going on here. Have compassion. You won't be able to grieve if shame and guilt start to swallow you. Go back to that control piece. Go back to that context. How did you get here? A lot of this is not your fault. Journal, 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 or do something about all the reality. And also what you're learning along the way. I'm a big believer. Walk away with something good. Make it worthwhile. Make it meaningful. It's often been said that the biggest crash and burns that we have create the biggest pivot points in our lives. So embrace that. Be aware that you also might be grieving a lot more things than just the situation in front of you. The belief is that if you 
couldn't grieve in the past for reasons that we've talked about in previous episodes. You know, when you were a kid, it just wasn't safe. There weren't safe people around you to grieve. Well, you stuffed those things and it created a huge snowball that just keeps getting bigger every time there was a loss or a trauma that you didn't grieve. And we have no control over when that snowball starts rolling down the hill towards you. So you may have what we call disproportionate grief reaction, where you're like, whoa, my reaction is a hell of a lot bigger than what's in front of me. That's okay. It just means you're grieving other stuff. And you may become conscious and memories might come up, dreams, flashbacks, ideas, or maybe not. Maybe you can't label it. That's okay. Try to think about what is being symbolized here. Like maybe there are core issues going on, like being able to trust another human being, being respected, being loved, trusting yourself to pick a good person, trusting yourself to be a good parent, all those things. Try to take really good care of yourself during this. And what I mean by that, get rest, take a walk, say no to what you can't handle right now, exercise, eat well, meditate, read, cry, and do it all again tomorrow. Healing hurts at first. If you've ever had a bad wound, you know that. If you've had surgery, you know that. But without surgery, you can't get the cancer out. Without surgery, you can't fix the problem. Healing is the only way forward. So the final stage, acceptance, I think it's peace that comes in its own time. It comes when it's supposed to. It comes when we're finished kicking and screaming. It comes when we've drawn some conclusions. We've extracted the lessons that I was talking about earlier. And I think, and this is very controversial, and I know a lot of you won't agree with me, and that's okay. But I think forgiveness comes on its own organically as a byproduct of acceptance. I don't think we can force it. That's just me. I think we can choose to want to forgive, but I think we got to walk through, even if it's just a mini grief process around a situation, to get to it, real, true acceptance and peace. So now that we've walked through all of that, I wanted to offer a brief exercise just to get you oriented and thinking. If you haven't done these before with us, these are sentence stems. So how it works is I'm going to read to you a beginning of a sentence, and you are going to finish the end of the sentence really quickly without thinking, without trying to write the right thing down. Four to six ending, just real quick. Good, bad, ugly, and different. Just trust what comes up. Do not edit it. Just scratch it out. If you're walking or you're driving, just try to see what comes up in your heart. It's all good. It's really helpful to do these um, more than once throughout the week, too, because you'll get different answers sometimes. You're unearthing your truth in this. It's just raising awareness. So I'll read each one, and I'll give you some time to think about or write down your endings. If you are part of the tribe, you got these in your newsletter today, so you already have it. If you don't, if you aren't a part of the tribe, just go over to ownitpowercast.com Go to this episode and sign up, and I'll send them to you. Okay, let's get started. Number one, when I imagine the idea of letting go and grieving, when I imagine the idea of letting go and grieving, Number two, one of the biggest things in my life I know I need to grieve right now is one of the biggest things in my life that I know I need to grieve right now is Number three, growing up, 
my anger and sadness were. Growing up, my anger and sadness were. And number four, if I were honest, the stage of grief I fear the most is. If I were honest, the stage of grief I fear the most is. Okay, so look over your answers or think about what came up for you and don't try to analyze it too much. Just accept it. That's your truth. And you may have gotten it right away like, yeah, of course, or some things like, whoa, where did that come from? And that's all okay. This is just raising awareness. It's just digging down underneath the surface to see what your real truth is. This is where the work gets done. It doesn't get done on the surface. It gets done in the deep and the vulnerable. That's the only way we connect with ourselves. So this was a big, big topic today about grief work. You'll notice going through a lot of the boundary work that there is grief work involved always because there's detachment, because not setting boundaries is all about control, which is how we keep ourselves from feeling and sitting in reality. It's normal to want to resist thinking about doing the grief work, because of course, who wants to? I'm just hoping that you walk away today understanding like, yep, I know I got to do it. And it's so cleansing and so life-changing if you allow it to come. And the way we allow it to come is to stop controlling, but also not medicating by distracting with other things or with substances or food or work or sex or shopping or whatever, but letting yourself have some moments each day where you just face it. You sit in it. You don't numb out. You feel it. Maybe you share it. So thank you so much for joining me today in a difficult but such important aspect of the boundary work. Be nice to yourself as you go through the rest of the week thinking about some of this. And I hope in my heart of hearts that you now have a better understanding and deeper compassion for those in your life who you're so frustrated with because they won't detach and grieve. If it were easy, we would have already done it. That's what I tell my clients all the time. Hey, if this were easy, we wouldn't be talking about it. But it's like one of my favorite quotes by Joe Campbell. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. Acceptance is peace. Acceptance is magic. It just takes some deep work to get to So go over to the show notes at ownitpowercast.com. Sign up and join the tribe and grab the bonus downloads that you need. Let me know how you're doing. Let me know if you need help. Go over there, hit the contact page. I will answer you. Let me know if you have any questions. Let me know how this work is helping you. And pass this on to other people who you know in your heart could possibly benefit from doing this work as well. So take good care of you. Keep paying it forward. You know where to keep the focus. And I'll see you next time. We hope you took away some useful insights and tools you can begin using right away. If you did, please leave a positive review and share on your social media. Because could you imagine if everyone in your life really got it together? Remember, Own it now, so you can really own it later.